Hello there. Welcome to Discussions with the Fashion Masters. My name is Deanna Hansen. I'm a certified athletic therapist and the founder of Fluid Isometrics and Block Therapy. And I am being joined by my nephew, Quinn Castlane, who's also my partner on this journey of block therapy and fluid isometrics. And I can't even express how excited I am to be interviewing Mr. Gil Headley. Now, I'm going to let Gil do all of the introduction about all the amazing things that he's doing. But just as a note, I think was it about 13 years ago that you put the fuzz speech out? I can't remember how long ago it was. It was a while ago. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So I was re- I was working with therapists at the time and I was teaching fluid isometrics. Um, and one of my massage therapists said, you have to watch this video by this anatomist, Gail Headley. So I watched it and I was absolutely blown away because it really brought to light what we were feeling inside the body and the absolute chaos that the fascia can be and the the tensions that actually exist inside the body. So it helped us explain what we were feeling beneath our fingertips. And it was just so impactful for us. So Gil, thank you so much for joining us. And if you can just share your journey and all about you and whatever you'd like to say, that would be wonderful. And then we'll dive into the world of fascia together. Well, thank you so much, Deanna and Quinn for having me on for a chat. And uh, I can tell you this much, I've learned a lot (laughs) since I did that little clip. I actually filmed that in 2005. And I've been telling that story for about 10 years. And I never told it again. (laughs) Because I I was like, wow, I recorded it. I don't have to say it anymore. Uh, So then I I developed my thought considerably since then, and hopefully in a way that refines it and makes it even more useful as a, as a guide to, to movement um, strategies for helping people, you know? Uh, And I did a tour in 2017. So that was 12 years after I recorded that. And it was called, uh, it was basically the fuzz tour. (laughs) <laughs> because that's how folks know me, uh, which is funny because I consider myself to be a whole whole person anatomist, but um, folks enjoy that so much. So I did the fuzz tour and it was basically called What's the Fuzz? You know, exploring fashion, healthy movement. And it took me four hours to unpack those five minutes. Uh, so I went to 46 cities and Sorry, I missed Winnipeg, but I did hit Toronto and Ontario and Montreal, uh, which was really fun. Pretty country. Wow. So, yes, just like us, we've certainly evolved in our thinking about the fascias. We continue to dive in. So Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the fuzz, can you explain your whole interpretation of what the fuzz is? Sure. Um, When I started doing dissection, and I was working with fixed forms, so embalmed cadavers. And I was, you know, using my hands. I was a rolfer. I was very manually oriented. And as I would differentiate, say, some muscle tissues, I'd see this cotton candy. It looked like cotton candy in between them. And I was like, I don't, I don't remember seeing that in the book. I, I, I don't know what that is. Maybe that's adhesions. I didn't really know. I was curious, but I did know that it kind of yielded to my fingertips. And I thought that was cool as a manual therapist. You know, I was like, maybe that's what I'm doing. I'm differentiating the tissues in that way. That's not true, actually. That's not what was going on. That fuzzy tissue was actually a membrane uh, that is the, the, the locus or the anatomy of differential movement in the musculoskeletal system. And without it, you can't go anywhere. Um, and when it's dried out and you tear it apart, it looks like cotton candy because the, the, the structure of the collagenous matrix of the tissue is chaotic and felted as opposed to highly uh, regularly organized as you see in the dense regular fibrous fascia, say the IT band where everything is like uh, you know, all lined up in, in, in long thick strands that cross purposes to each other and looking very orderly. So the, the disorder of the, of the fuzzy tissues or this, what I came to call filmy fascia after about 10 years, the disorder of that wasn't disorder at all. It's just the order of it is felted as opposed to um, regular arrays of tissues that cross purposes to each other. 
and when you tear it apart, it, it looks it looks that way. But if you let it be and exist where it lives, then it's a functional membrane membrane system that's um, basically the renders it possible for there to be a continuous body, right? In other words, the, everything is connected and yet there's differential movement. So how does nature work that out? Nature works out differential movement in a continuous system by having some tissues be highly organized and some tissues less organized. Uh, and the less organization allows for play between the more organized tissues. So wherever we have differential movement in the human form, we have that fuzzy stuff, uh, which in fact, in the living form is super hydrated, wet, transparent, um, and and highly, highly functional. You don't want to get rid of it. You can dissect it away, and that's really fun. But in the living form, you're not trying to make it go away. You're trying to make it slippery. Right, so its natural state is slippery, uh, but under under conditions of um, dehydration, inflammation, stasis, under those conditions, then it becomes less slippery, and less slippery means less differential movement. And if it becomes really less slippery, then it can create you know adhesions, crystallizations, and uh, loss of differential movement. So, after years of calling it fuzz. 10 years of calling it fuzz. And I spent 13 years calling it filmy fascia, which I thought was pretty appropriate because as a texture person, it was kind of slippery and filmy. And it was definitely fascia because I can cut it into sheets. And so after 23 years, <laughs> I was like, I need a new word for this stuff because uh, the anatomists don't can't relate to these terms, fuzz and filmy fascia. It's very colloquial and it works great in our communities for conversation. But I invented the word perifascia actually to to be an anatomical nomenclature worthy word for the fuzz so perifascia uh, basically is a way to bring the mind the mind's attention to the fact that hey this is fascia it's not it's not a waste product or something it's fascia um, I can it's an aggregate of tissues that I can cut into sheets that surrounds wraps and so it's a fascia right so uh, it's a fascia and it's and it's a fascia that goes around other fascias in fact it's a it's the fascia in which other fascia are embedded you could say so filmy fascia is on one side of the deep fascia it's on the other side of the deep fascia and it's going through it at that point we have to say the deep fascia is embedded in perifascia rather than the other way around so that's a that's a super <laughs> I mean, I know it took me five minutes to do it, but that, that's a pretty super, uh, super condensed version of, of my learning curve with respect to these tissues. Um, started out not sure they belong there just because they weren't drawn or described, uh, not in a way that made sense to me. Um, really, anatomists did include them in their books. They called it loose aerial connective tissue, loose areolar connective tissue. And loose areolar connective tissue turns out not to be so loose and not so areolar as you might think, because I can cut it into sheets anywhere in the body over and over again on camera reliably. It's there. It deserves our attention because for movement people, if that's the locus of differential movement in our musculoskeletal system, we darn well better know that if it's not in, in, in its wonderful slippery state, maybe we should use that as a consideration for why we're not having beautiful fluid differential movement. I am just so excited right now. <laughs> so basically with block therapy, we address the perifascial system, um, nice. which is so lovely because yeah. And, and what's really neat is with our approach with block therapy into the fascia, it's understanding that when we are perfectly aligned, there's a flow that emanates flow first leaves as a wave, then it spirals, then it turns into chaos. Mm -hmm. So we approach when we're going into, we, we use our tools. We've got two different sizes, the block buddy and the block baby that are made of bamboo. So that um, because bamboo is similar in density to bone, we really want to be able to address those dense constricted layers and create movement between the bone and the block. So we can mm -hmm. create that heating. And we mm -hmm. do that with a combination of pressure over time, combined with instruction of proper diaphragmatic breathing to turn the internal body into a, a furnace, a, a heating machine, because most people aren't really activating their diaphragm um, beautifully. And I love that video. Um, by the way, uh, we were introduced to have this conversation by one of our block therapists, Rachel Aberly, 
Um, and she has shared a couple of your videos with me. And the one with the, the, the diaphragm and the rib cage, that was absolutely fantastic when you were squeezing it as the exhale. And then naturally, even though this cadaver was eight months on your table, I believe you said, you know, yeah. here we've got it still, still working. Like that was just mind blowing. Could you share a little bit more about what you observed with that? Well, as you take stuff away from a form and generate an ever more abstract example of human tissues, uh, it's fun to play and find out, you know, what properties remain even after you've taken something away. So if I'm remembering that video correctly, and I've done hundreds and hundreds of hours of videos at this point, sure. uh, I, th I think um, I was squidging on Z's rib cage and then letting go and watching the recoil. So a lot of that is coming from the rib heads, right? And, and the, the still remnant elasticity uh, in the rib heads because I had taken all the musculature away at that point, if I recall. Um, so it's a, the mechanics of the body are amazing and sophisticated and under described. And so the things that, the way that we explain how things are operating tend to be a little bit short, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit shy of reality, let's say, and, uh, and sometimes very far from reality. And sometimes our descriptions are pure fantasy. And that's fine to tell you the truth, because it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> if it helps someone to move better, I don't really give a hoot whether my thing is absolutely accurate, if it's evocative enough to elicit a response in a person that serves them, right? So that's that's the power of myth, the power of poetry, isn't its its um its uh veracity in, in terms of the specifics of the physical world. There's more to us than that. And and our movement and our excellent movement and our excellent breathing is rarely elicited by certainty of the mechanics of breathing. It rather comes from inspiration. Uh, and so I'm glad that video was a little bit inspiring for you. It sure was. Uh, one of the three foundational pillars of block therapy is to address proper diaphragmatic breathing. And what is, is really fun about our process is we start in the rib cage in the core so that we can release those adhesions per or whatever. I don't even know if I'm using the right terminology anymore. So please correct me if I use the wrong, but um, so we can release those adhesions from the rib cage and create more of that pump to actively work better. And um, well, that's great because that yeah. that movement, right? That that most essential, you know, expansion and and relaxation in our form is is the kind of the the resource uh, uh, for generating differential movement throughout the body. Um, so. I'd have to say you picked a good place to start. Thank you. And something, we, so go ahead. Finn. Something that's also like really interesting with that video is when you showed that you apply pressure on the rib cage, it will automatically go back and expand. So yeah. with block therapy or with Deanna, I should say how she teaches every student is to always focus on the exhalation phase of the breath first, hmm. because that will really help take care of the inhalation because a lot of people yes. inhale too much, inhale too much. They don't exhale enough out of the lungs, out of the tissue, out like the byproducts of functioning, the toxins, everything out. So when we instruct people to firstly address the exhalation phase of the breath, then they're creating that compression in the rib cage. They're pushing all the toxins out. And then you don't really have to think of the inhalation phase of the breath. It just will automatically happen. So that's a really cool thing. Um, that's right. That's right. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a freebie. Exactly. You don't, you don't have exactly. to. Yeah, we shouldn't. If we're working to inhale, we're, we're actually trying to overcome the resistance in our body to life. I love that. Um, and it's mm. pretty common that we're resisting the movements of life, whether it be breath or, um, or, or the movements of our heart. 
right? We we um, we resist that, and we resist it in a thousand different ways, because our silly little hamsters inside of our head think we we know best, and uh, we really don't. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> Isn't it though? Um, mm-hmm. When we're dealing with our, our clients, our students, we always look at the uh, body as a whole and we look at the cause sites to what's causing pain and dysfunction. And we've observed that the calves and the feet are some of the major holding patterns for the whole body. Um, when you're doing your dissections, what do you experience when you're, when you're down in that area in the calves? Because for us, I mean, like we're, it, it's concrete. Like when I'm working with physical bodies, like literally the calves can often feel like concrete. And I see that as really being one of the main reasons why so many people that are addressing pain in the back or the shoulder aren't getting those long-term results. Because as soon as you t- start taking a step, your fascia will pull you back into the pattern that is relevant in the calves and the feet because they're the most frozen from the way I see it because, because they're the furthest from the engine, um, Mm. the diaphragm. So, um, I've, I've worked with so many people and it was years ago when I, Quinn and I actually, um, we had done a 21 day challenge and it was for centered around, um, managing a proper healthy size and shape. And we did it through the Christmas season. And what was really interesting about it was, I think there was, uh, over 80 people that joined Mm -hmm. and, all but a few had actually um, improved in their size and shape through this 21 day process. So fortunately, a couple of the people actually lived here in Winnipeg that didn't change in, in the right direction. So I wanted to see why, like, why, why didn't these people? And I realized, okay, it's their calves and their feet. So as soon as I got them working that area, then, you know, major changes happened. So that was, that was a number of years back when Quinn and I were first starting together, like six or seven years ago. So since Mm -hmm. then we've evolved in our thinking and our process on how to look at the body and really see what's causing what. So when we're dealing with things like scoliosis, for example, we always um, address the calves and the feet first. So we can bring that foundation back into play as well as the forearms and the hands, because, you know, they're going to manipulate everything. and, And again, they're also the furthest from the engine. So being able to release those adhesions and really bring proper foundation back into the body has made um, some in- incredible gains for us from the perspective and understanding of how to approach um, dysfunction in the body and how to bring it back to balance and alignment. Mm. Well, you sound like y'all are are working your way into some of um, what Ida Rolf uh, also discovered, you know, because she started with the breath and Often in, in her facilitation of the breath, she'd work the forearms. And then that, that was the first session. And then you'd go on down to the feet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's funny. It's, it's, it's wonderful to hear that echo because, um, oh, my gosh. This, <laughs> that echo. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was Ida Rolf. That um, was timely. <laughs> yeah, from beyond. Um, I got that little button clicked now, so we should be good. But uh so in the in the laboratory, you know, in the cadaver forms, well, it's just a given that the 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 lower legs are very heavily wrapped. You know, it's a pretty sturdy fascial system, you know, below the waist is quite different than above the waist in terms of the in terms of the the way the fascia forms. Um so certainly a rich a rich place to work and I I no doubt, as you as you've said, it it works out that way. But I can't really, I don't, I don't see what you feel in the same way, because the, remember the cadaver, whether it's fixed or unfixed, meaning embalmed or not embalmed, is is a liar in many ways, right? In other words, it's not a person. It's a, it's a model of a person and, and a reduction, an abstraction. The breath is completely gone. All the movement is, is gone. And sometimes stuff, like in the case of the embalmed bodies, something's been added that's changed the texture of the tissues. Now, I'm kind of a, I mean, after all these years, I'm pretty good at reading those changes and being able to kind of pull from what I'm seeing, the artifacts of the processes of death or embalming and distinguishing those from what was that person's anatomy 
or a variation. It's like if you're running in the woods and you see broken twig and you see some scat and you see some hoof prints, uh, you know, you can deduce a deer uh, to a point of great accuracy. You know, you can even know something about the deer, you know, what's how big it is or its health status. You can deduce those things from those tracks and evidence that you see. And you can say, oh, that person's living in fantasy. They're crazy. They imagine some big animal and all we have here is some dirt and some berries and some broken twigs. But sure enough, you know, a few paces down, there's a deer. It's kind of like that in the dissection lab. I'm looking at tracks. I'm looking at the tracks of a life. I'm, I'm reading someone's diary as left in a footprint or literally a discarded shoe. You know, you can, if you took my shoe, you could learn a lot about me if you knew anything about gait and weight and nutrition, even from the stank of my shoe. You know what I'm saying? So, you, so I don't see quite, I don't get the privilege that you have working with the living of, of feeling their, their life force present or or, or withdrawn in the living form. Or I don't get to see the, the limitations of movement that come from, say, pain or pattern in that, in that given person that you, can, that you see in the living, but you don't see in the dead because there's no muscle tone in the dead body. There's no anxiety about moving the shoulder a little further because you've gone past the pain threshold and that... You know, you could take a little old lady's arms and go, you know, uh, in an unfixed form and think, oh, my God, she was Gumby. You know, she was uh, she was a gymnast. She was a contortionist, you know, but none of that's true. None of that could have happened in the, the living form in that exact same set of tissues. Uh, and you do see, you know, absolute limitations on tissues in dissection uh, that you can be like, yeah, that wasn't going anywhere past there um, when there's certain scarring or or bony formations or metal plates holding things from here to there, you know, all the sort of thing that you see. But, but the real experts uh, in, in witnessing limitations of movement are you, you know, people who watch the living folks in movement and to see the emotional content of those restrictions as well as the physical ones and then work with that. And that is so impactful. I remember the first time I was working on a four-year-old with spina bifida and she was mm. paralyzed from the waist down and she'd had a, a surgery when she was um, just a baby and they had cut her Achilles tendon because her foot was so twisted. Mm. So now I'm working on, on these adhesions and it was so intriguing for me because that was years and years ago, earlier on in my practice. And I am reefing on this little girl's foot and she can't feel anything. So I'm very aware she's watching TV and entertaining herself as I'm working on this. And I'm like, I'm just pulling this. And, and, and I mean, no, I mean, it, it only resulted in positive improvement in movement of the ankle, but there was nothing stopping me from being able to do that. And that was the first time I absolutely recognized how much that emotional component gets in the way of the actual movement that we do have, because yes, there obviously is actual limitation, but that, that freeze response, that holding pattern and how incredibly strong it is in our body when we're afraid to move. So a absolutely our movement, our movement is a function of our person, uh, which is a conglomerate of emotions and memories and, and, uh, and hopes and dreams. And it completely governs movement and therefore what happens in the body over time so the patterns that are there you know are the patterns of a person's life and uh it's to me the mo most essential element because to i see i don't want to say most essential let's say this it's as good a place as any to enter the circle of a person's patterns you can do it with your hands but if you if a person isn't on board with the change that you provide them because the change in their movement doesn't fit their world, 
it's not going to hold. It doesn't matter how good your work is because there's still value in the compensation for that person until they no longer value the compensation or have need for it. They're going to, they're going to use it and, and recreate the pattern. And that's part of what we, what I'm so excited with uh, our, the response that we're getting with the people doing block therapy, because a, you're choosing to do this. It's not a therapist putting their hand yeah. in your body. You are literally encountering this. And for us, it's all about teaching people to search for pain. So we teach them to um, take fear out of the pain fear cycle Mm. and to actively go into the pain. And when you're on the block, you're on there for a minimum of three minutes, as Mm. long as your breath allows. And and the rule of the rule Mm -hmm. is as long as you can breathe in a relaxed way, it's going to feed and heal the tissue. If something hurts so much that you can't connect to your proper breath, that's your body saying, this is too much and we need to back off. So then we Mm -hmm. can show variations, but the time in, and then the very, very slow controlled movement, those, those pressure fibers override those pain fibers. And then people can dive into those deeper layers. And what's so amazing, we have a community of over 5,000 people, a Facebook community. And Mm -hmm. I would say the majority or not, not the majority, but a good, a good chunk of the questions and the support that's required is those emotional releases that people have when they mm. open up the fascia. And then, you know, suddenly people are in tears or they're angry or whatever emotion needs to come up. But that's such a common um, response. And, and those old traumas coming to the surface. In fact, today there was even a beautiful um, uh, post by one of our community members who shared that for the first time encountering her father didn't leave her stressed out because Mm. she was breathing as we had trained her through the process. Mm. So she was able to still encounter that, but not pull it in and let it take hold in her system. So she still felt open and free from the process of blocking. How wonderful. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, Keep it up. Well, and that's, that's like a really interesting component that took me a little bit of time to really understand is you need to give permission for that trauma or that memory to go. So you can do block therapy and watch a show and kind of just be nonchalant about it, which is, which is great. You're still going to get a benefit, but if you're really in the practice of doing it and you're connecting with the pain and then you feel an emotion come up because there's so many different kinds of pain that you experience on the block, mm-hmm. like some that are just undescribable and they're all going to be unique to each individual. So pain is pain. And we have to understand that's part of being human and that's connected to the emotion, the past traumas as well. So when we are on the block and we connect to something and find something really unique and it might bring up frustration or fear or massive anxiety you have to exhale that out of the body you have to give it permission to leave so that's why we always really focus on that exhalation phase of the breath Mm -hmm. and if it's just too intense and too overwhelming because you're getting really deep ease off it's not a process of rushing it's a process Mm -hmm. of melting Mm -hmm. and and we use the term melting as we release but you're like opening up new layers in the fascia where we do believe emotion trauma is stored and then you have to give it permission to leave and you have to want to change because if you're just doing it like Deanna you explained it perfectly like people aren't going to see someone to work on them they're making a conscious decision to heal themselves so you have to really accept that process and that is where I really see the magic happening and not even just from an emotional perspective, but from just making change, even posturally, or even with scoliosis, because scoliosis, how much trauma is going to be trapped in somebody's body who's been living with scoliosis or severe scoliosis for a year, five, 10, 20, 30 years, a lot. So it's going to take time. And that's why we always say you have to go at your own pace. Mm -hmm. You have to find the pace that works for you. And that's kind of like we put the power in your hands, right? And that it's been really cool to see because the more you do this, the more you realize like you just keep getting deeper and deeper and you understand your body more and more. And it's just a never ending process, which I love 
Deanna and I both love that because we never want just an end game. We always want to keep exploring more of the body. So it's been a really cool journey, just exploring your own body with block therapy. You sound like so monots to me. Pardon I was me? just going to, oh my gosh, I was just going to say so, so monots, like uh, oh. inner exploration. And, and our, yeah. our first pillar is creating space. So we create the space that's been lost over time because over time, gravity compresses and manipulates and we wind down and then we get those hard adhesive areas that, you know, there's so little flow and it's, it's neat. We had done a, a, one of these discussions with Dr. Eric Robbins, who's in our community and he also does TRE. And he was saying that because now he's combining TRE with block therapy, because we address the calves and the feet, he feels that's the reason that they're having so much more success getting the trauma out of the body because prior to that it, it's, it's a holding point it's a sticking point for that flow in and out of the body so to be able to open up that flow create the space with the breath inflate the space and then through postural education that we share with our programs maintaining that internal space our goal is to make sure that every single cell in the body is where it's supposed to be as opposed to being pulled away from its home and the further it's pulled away the more the more pain until there's no pain because there's really no life left in that tissue in that living body, but mm -hmm. we can bring it back by releasing those adhesions, engaging the breath and the blood flow and oxygen into that space, and then bringing it back into use through, through the process of just understanding how to be like the building, you know, make sure that your, your foundations and, and everything is where it's supposed to be while you move properly. And isn't it amazing that we weren't ever trained in any of this? Like nobody really ever taught us how to breathe. I mean, you'd think it would be the most natural thing, but um, it, it's, it's not. <laughs> I, I think it is the most natural thing, but what's not natural is our resistance to it. And so, although maybe that's natural too, because we're all doing it, but I mean, if you're in fear and you're expecting to be hit, for instance, or whether emotionally or physically, and so you you know, squeeze your abdomen, your rectus abdominis, like in preparation for a blow. It's a little like putting a dumbbell on your breath, right? You're, it's a weight. It's like an anchor. It's pulling down on your rib cage and disabling that, that, that natural expansion that happens, uh, that would happen effortlessly if it weren't for the emotional resistance to it. Or if you're having an emotional reaction to something, and that's your solar plexus right there, you can lock it out of fear, or you can lock it out of resistance to expressing that because the culture doesn't permit it at that time or place. I'm in a library, I'm online at the supermarket, and suddenly I'm overwhelmed with emotion. In our culture, we don't just like have a breakdown and start sobbing on the person in front of us in the grocery line. We, we lock it and hold it. And then it's like, oh, well, there's really no time while I'm taking the kids to the baseball game either. So it's not going to happen now. And you can put these things off for a decade, you know, and, and, and create a, a permanent pattern. So I think that breathe, I think, I do think breathing is the simplest, most automatic. It's a, it's an, there are a few things in our bodies that are free gifts, right? The, the breath cycle, the rhythm of the heart, sex, right? These things are, are, are innate, essential, expansive and contractile impulses of the living form. That's just like the gift, right? Also, I would add levity. So the, the not, gra not gravity, but levity, the, the, the natural orientation of the viscera stacked over each other in such a way that the pressure differentials generate a sense of lightness and buoyancy in the whole form in a biped. So was that four? Yeah, that was four, four freebies that are essential, um, not es essential components of the, of the living form. And then in every conceivable manner, we resist all four of them. <laughs> with our social constructs and our, our fears and our way of relating in the world. And society and our communities, our, our, our forms of spirituality and, and our family structures all create where we move 
where we breathe, where our hearts beat, the context of our sexuality, the context of our bipedality as a light being. Because sometimes it's, it's like where you see your grandmother and it looks like she's wearing the weight of the world upon her shoulders. And then your mother looks kind of like that too. And then, oh, turns out me too, you know, and, and we're all kind of carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. Well, you know, it wasn't placed there by anything but your perception of the world. And so we're, we're born free uh, and we have these elements and then we, we work against our, our own gift of, of freedom, I think. Um, and so I love these kinds of explorations that you're describing, that you're doing, um, especially with the self-directed character of it. So a person can choose to be free again, in a sense, relative to the constraints and constructs and social forms that have generated that body in that way. And those compensations, which you know, may at certain times be functional and serviceable, but don't lend themselves to the full expansion of the human. Absolutely. I love that. When I was in uh, yoga teacher training years and years ago, um, one of the things that I learned that really stuck with me is that we're born in this lifetime with a signature posture. And the goal of this lifetime is to break through that signature posture. And I see that the signature posture is really the breathing pattern of the mother. We're, mm. we're born with her breathing pattern. So whatever restrictions, adhesions is in her um, system, we are born with. And then we're pummeled with the rest of the world and manipulated from that point. So it's really exciting for us to see is that we're actually changing that breathing pattern and we're getting rid of all the things that come with that. I mean, we can see how the bunion is really created from the breathing pattern because that creates the off-centeredness, which changes the gait, which over time creates the mechanics to change. So we're, we're helping people bring their bodies back into that balance through changing that breathing pattern and opening up those spaces that were blocked because the breath simply wasn't able to get to those spaces. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is uh, so, so grateful that you are here to share the light on the anatomy. We, we don't dive into the anatomy so much. I really want people to keep their brain free of the detail and really dive into their body and feel and mm -hmm. not get caught up in the logic because mm -hmm. this isn't a logical process. It's, it's literally taking time out of your tissue as you put the space back and, mm -hmm. and, and it's pretty profound in, in what's happening for people. So um, and, and you giving us that structure of what's going on just really helps again, like you did in past for me really helps cement that what we're doing is, is we're taking people's bodies into those four things that you said, we're, we're bringing the breath into a conscious form. We're bringing that levity back into the body by putting that space there so that we can take mm -hmm. our bodies in an, an effortless effort form rather than pulling the body with gravity tugging on us with all these mm -hmm. anchors and roots holding us back. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can enjoy things like sex. We even, oh, I just have to share. We did, <laughs> last month, we did an all things pelvic floor series. Awesome. Yeah. And Quinn and I were doing this side by side. And um, I do think it's easier for women, um, but it was just quite comical because the adhesions, of course, at the base of the core, they're, they're pretty intense and there's a lot of nerves there. So it can be pretty painful. So um, our yeah, whole community what? was in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it wasn't easy for me <laughs> i also have a, a bodybuilding background which caused a lot of adhesions compression um and that was also when i was definitely angrier in my past so a lot of stored anger trapped in my tissue as mm -hmm. i'm creating density in the body so imagine all the deadlift squats and bent over rows where the pelvic floor the perineum are is always under so much pressure so that was by far the most painful experience, but one of the most profound changes I felt. Mm. And I just felt al aligned, grounded, just shifts throughout my entire body. Mm. Like it was really cool, but it ended up turning into a comedy skit for many people because they're just <laughs> laughing at my pain, <laughs> but it's good to laugh at it. Well, I can certainly relate to that. I was one of those bodybuilding weightlifting types in my youth and uh certainly generated a whole gaggle of problems that i'm still working out mm -hmm. um but the uh 
there's also we've talked a lot about pain, but there's also um, pleasure and increasing our tolerance for pleasure, right? As we we can all you can sit around and talk about pain all day long, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, little old ladies get together over tea and 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 talk about pain and that's totally legit but how often do they talk about the quality of their orgasm probably not as frequently right we have our own cultural resistance to pleasure and we disapprove of it actually on our continent you know just landed on by puritans and pilgrims um we we brought with us uh, an extreme anxiety around pleasure. And that has permeated our, our culture. And you can have both, I've learned. <laughs> you can have your pain if you want to hold on to it. Um, and sometimes you're just stuck with it because the earth is a painful place at times. So it's pretty hard to get away you know, with a tour on earth without enduring some serious pain. Um, at the same time, though, even, even though this can be a very painful place, um, we also have a native potential for pleasure that's quite extreme, though rarely explored in a, in a culture that sort of disdains pleasure. And as Somanas, uh, we can become expert connoisseurs of pain and its qualities and work with that with a view to releasing it, which is awesome, and then enjoying the freedom of movement that comes from that. But you can also kind of put pleasure on the radar too and be like, oh, this. I can actually find good feelings here. And if I magnify those, how might that serve the project of healthy movement and the uh, sl slippering up of my fairy fashion? <laughs> that sounded almost dirty. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, I often, uh, you know, cross the line talking to Quinn about there's certain things. And um, yeah, we, we've had some funny conversations around that, but absolutely true. Like people, people just, you know, pull away from that whole concept of talking about pleasure. And uh, I do think that's a very understated conversation that we should be having. And, and maybe if we change the, that in itself, we'd be smiling a lot more. Yeah. I, I do. I do love your fuzz speech when you were talking about like the monk, like the expressions and, and, you know, you, you hold on to that expression long enough and it actually becomes like, that's part of your face. So oh, yeah, your mother was it. right. Your mother was right. <laughs> if you keep that doing that face, it's going to stay. And <laughs> true. So true. Well, Gil, this has been absolutely wonderful, enlightening. And again, you know, so honored that you spent the time so that we could share this with our community. Um, and we also want to share your work with everybody that listens. Um, so we'll we'll put all the links below. But do you want to share a little bit about your courses just so people can hear what it is that you, you teach? Well, for many years, the main way to connect with me has been to come to a dissection lab. And then... I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of expensive for folks and maybe they can't travel or whatever. And so I made videos that I sold as DVDs and I just stuck them online. So there's a whole ton of free stuff that I offer, whether on the Somanot YouTube channel or just at my website. Uh, I have an easy rider membership, <laughs> which is free. Um, and you just join the site. It's a, I like to have folks join. I don't put everything on YouTube because it's not a great, venue and they're constantly adulting my videos and putting warnings on them and stuff. So I, my website is a nicer place and you're not constantly being pulled away from the content. And I don't ever advertise on, on YouTube. So I think they're mad at me, uh, <laughs> but on my website, uh, the easy writer membership is like 17 hours of free video content. Um, three full courses, including that tour talk I did that explains the fuzz much more deeply. Um, so that's all free. And then I have a subscriber um, 
uh, a paid subscription rather now that includes 40 hours of continuing ed approved continuing ed maybe not so much in canada they're having they're a little sluggish approving online continuing ed up in uh up in canada with with our our work but you can still watch it and learn from it uh and then in a total of maybe at this point about 130 hours of 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 uh video content including the a to z project which i spent 17 months filming uh, over the past year and a half and now i'm editing it out so um 15 bucks a month you get you know monthly live chats on various topics that i do i call it live with gill as well as all that content and the continuing ed credit all for the same 15 bucks so you can just come join for a month quit you cancel it's a subscription so you have to cancel it to get out of it but you can join and cancel that day and binge watch for a month that's fine with me i don't care um and you will literally yeah, you will. There's a lot of stuff there and a lot more coming. I have about 160 hours of, of already shot video in the can on the wow. AZ project where I went through the entire human body on camera, two bodies, and I follow them from, from scratch to finish. Like, I mean, it's thorough. Um, I think that content is about 240 hours when I'm done and it will provide, I think, a foundation for very a variety of modalities, massage and folks like yourselves and, and yoga and Pilates, and it should last those folks for another 30 or 40 years, I figure. And then <laughs> I'm going to go on and do a very deep nervous system dissection in about the same time frame. I'm going to spend about a year and a half just dissecting the nervous system on camera um, in the hopes of creating a foundational content and resource for the physicians and osteopaths and naturopaths and all those folks that will also be a lasting contribution. Wow. That is absolutely fascinating. And you have, you have absolutely created a foundation of knowledge that um, we certainly appreciate immensely. And uh, thank you so much for your, your time and commitment to teaching all of us about what you see and what goes on inside the body from that cadaver standpoint. And um, Quinn, do you have anything else you'd like to share? No, I think we we covered a lot. That was just such a pleasure to uh, listen to you speak about this um, live on the call. So again, thank you so much. A lot of gratitude to you and um, really excited for people to hear this conversation. And I thank highly you, recommend Quinn. everybody mm -hmm. to join and to learn. The more we understand what totally. goes on inside these mm -hmm. These containers that we live in, um, I think the, the better the better off we are in every possible way. So um, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Deanna. Thanks, Quinn. I appreciate right. you. Thank you. We'll see y'all soon. Bye.